talking about pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so we're doing this in partnership with Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis, who you may hear me refer to as APF on occasion. Um, so our first session is called Why Do We Test? Um, and we're going to have some discussion, some presentations on radiology, breathing tests and blood tests. And then we'll have a patient perspective at the end of that. So firstly, I would like to introduce Dr. Liz O'Donovan. Hi, Sarah. Uh, hi, everybody. And um, um, I was going to say for my slide advances. Yeah, perfect. So that was an amazing talk from Benjamin. It's a very difficult um, act to follow, but I will do my best. So I'm here today. Good morning. I'm going to speak to you about the what and why of high resolution computer tomography or HRCT. And I'm a radiologist here at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital. So pulmonary fibrosis, um, this is an interstitial lung disease diagnosis, and that comes from um, information from multiple sources. Radiology is obviously an important part of the diagnostic process, but we do work together closely with the clinicians and the histopathologists and the physiologists to make those diagnoses. So as a radiologist, um, I'm looking basically for scar tissue in the lung, um, which makes it become thickened and stiff. Now, it might be that they have a chest X-ray um, as the first indicator of there being an abnormality. I've got a chest X-ray here. Um, usually the lungs, either side of the big white thing in the middle, which is the heart, is usually quite black. And this has got lots of busy lines all over it. So I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, there's an interstitial, some, some fibrotic process going on here. But it's very difficult for me to further characterize it from that chest X-ray. And indeed, they can actually appear completely normal even if you've got a mild process going on. So usually we would progress to doing something called um, an HRCT, which is a high resolution computer tomography study. And that's the same patient, but they've actually had this scan. Um, and that's using a special machine, which I'll show you on the next slide, which uses X-rays to produce very fine slices of your lungs. So we get a much better look. And that study allows us a much earlier diagnosis of fibrosis, which might dramatically help transform the course of the disease. Um, it can distinguish between different types of fibrosis much, much better than a chest X-ray. Again, it shows our severity and it can monitor the progression treatment response. So on this patient's CT scan, you can see all those little sort of wispy lines that we saw in the chest X-ray are much more defined. We can see lots of lines, lots of irregularity. We can almost see some airways at the edges all getting sort of dragged apart. So it shows how much better it is for us. So if you're invited for a high resolution CT, um, it might be on a van, it might be in the hospital, you would come, um, you'd meet the radiographers and you would see a machine like this, which is basically a donut shaped or polo mint shaped scanner that's got all the x-ray machine within it and a table, which is the bed, which is what you lie on. Um, it can be done in different ways, but in our um, institution, we lie people on their tummy and we say they're sunbathing. So lying on their tummy with their arms up above their head, you don't need to have a drip or a cannula in your arm because we don't inject any dye in this scan. So that's quite nice. It takes about five to 10 minutes on the table. And um, whilst you're on there, you will have to hold your breath a couple of times while we take the images and, and check you're in the right position. But the scan itself takes mere, mere seconds. And then the machine's very clever. It makes very thin slices of your chest. Um, and then the computer creates that into an image that we can then look at. And the, the, the slices are thinner than a normal CT, so we get much better appreciation of, of the lung tissue and the airways, et cetera. Um, so that's the kind of scan we might see. Um, we can actually sort of fly up and down through these like a video. Um, so we go top to bottom, we can go front to back, side to side, and really sort of scrutinize th those airways and the lung tissue. So the patient's had the scan and the scan pops into our reporting inbox. And our next job basically is to look at the scan and decide, is there any fibrosis? And we do this by looking for different patterns of fibrosis. So um, the picture on the left is of normal lung. So you've got very black aerated lung there, which is nice and healthy. The white sort of branch-like root-like structures are actually the vessels going through the lung. So we'd look at that and think, well, that's lovely and normal. The scan next to it in the middle, we're starting to see some sort of thickened lines at the edge sort of coming in and the smooth, the edge of the lung is a bit irregular and that's called reticulation. And that's basically, it's supposed to be like a sort of fishing net like structure. So too many lines, thickening of the septa. And what we're actually seeing is the framework of the lung, which is usually invisible, um, is becoming thickened and it's being demonstrated in our imaging by these funny lines. And I've tried to draw over them with my green pen, not so sort of 
gently, but just to try and show you what we're looking for. And that's one sign of fibrosis that we might see. Another sign is something called traction bronchiectasis or traction dilatation of the airways. And that's where the airways are getting abnormally and irreversibly dragged apart. So they're no longer sort of slender and thin and smooth and small. They're irregular and widened. Um, and that's often worse towards the edges of the lung where there's sort of less connective tissue to hold things in place. And we've got another example there. So all the red arrows are, po are pointing to these irregular dilated airways that are being dragged apart by fibrosis. Honeycombing, and that's another um, factor that we see, and that's characteristic of established fibrosis. And it's a very important criteria when we're diagnosing certain types of fibrosis, such as usual interstitial pneumonia or IPF. Um, here we can see thickened um, circular cysts, and they're often stacked on top of each other at the ed edge of the lung. And it's meant to be like, and to radiologists like to eat, we like to sort of make things look like things, and there's some honeycomb there. So we're basically showing the stacking cysts that we would see um, at the edge of the lung. And again, I've tried to draw over those, what I'm looking at, these cysts. If, if the report says honeycombing, that's what we're seeing there. And another type um, of fibrosis is ground glass. We might see this, which is a haziness or sort of opaqueness of the lung. So the picture on the left is black normal lung and the milky lung in the middle has got ground glass and that's meant to be like somebody like a pub window where it's been ground down so it's not completely translucent with areas you can see through it's like a bathroom window as well. So when we see that we know there's abnormal lung there but we can still see the vessels and the airways through it. There are lots of other patterns unfortunately that I could go through but we don't sadly have enough time to go through those today. So once the scan's been in on my inbox and I've looked through it and I've tried to see what different types of fibrosis I may or may not be seeing, I'm then trying to classify it down into four sort of main groups. This slide is very busy and I won't go through it at all, but essentially, has the patient got usual interstitial pneumonia, which is well, um, basically um, at the bases around the sides with honeycombing and traction dilatation of the airways, or am I less likely to think that there isn't any honeycombing, or could it possibly indeterminate or something altogether different. So I'm trying to break it down to those four groups. So this is a scan that we might have seen in our um, radiology reporting box. This patient's got idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and that has got this usual interstitial pneumonia pattern that I've mentioned, the, one of the first classifications on that system on the page before. And we can see lots of those little subplural, so at the edge of the lung, honeycomb cysts. I've got the thickened mesh-like lines of the reticulation, and I've got airways getting dragged out, so the traction dilatation of the airways. And the slide uh, picture next to it was a sideways view, shows it sort of at the front and at the back getting worse towards the bottom. So that's the kind of classic sort of distribution that we'd be looking for. Um, another case that we might get is non-specific interstitial pneumonia or NSIP. Um, and that can be um, sort of reversible cellular just um, or a, can go onto a fibrotic type pattern. And the picture on the left is the ground glass milky lung. We've still got the um, airways and vessels nicely seen through that. I'm not seeing any significant lines or anything else, but the sideways view on the right is showing those airways getting dragged out towards the periphery as the fibrosis is pulling those airways apart. And we can see those little thin lines around the side, uh, the reticulation and some, some milky ground glass change as well. Or we might see something like a hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So the scan on, on the left, we've got um, little tiny nod nodules. We've got patches of the ground glass change and something we call the mosaic pattern, which is basically a bit like a patchwork quilt. So different blackness, grayness and whiteness of the lung. You can see representing bits of air getting trapped in those areas and it's often in the upper and mid zones and then the scan to the right is showing a more advanced fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis where we've got all those thickened lines at the edge we've got airways getting dragged apart and we've got the the cystic change around the edge as well and some areas of air trapping so when we're doing the radiology, that you've had the scan, we've chosen the pattern, we've then gone to uh, break it down into a classification. We try to pinpoint the type of fibrosis, but we often bring them to a multidisciplinary meeting because the diagnosis can be very difficult due to the similar symptoms, radiology, histo, and the physiology of the patients. And we find that together we can try and direct 
or narrow down the differential, which helps direct the management and treatment choices. So um, we might also be looking for progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So that includes me looking at the imaging to see if there has been evidence of progression, so increasing reticulation or traction or honeycomb over usually a one or a two year period. And then we put that together, the clinicians and the physiologists, has there been worsening respiratory symptoms or lung function decline? And two of three, out of three of those over a year, um, we, can, we can give them a diagnosis that there has been some progressive fibrosis and that can help aid the treatment decisions. Um, we've got a couple of scans here. So the top scan um, is a patient who's got some little lines at the edge, a little bit of airway traction, and possibly some very early honeycombing. And then 1B, we can see that we've now got thicker lines and holes in the traction and a bit of cystic honeycomb. And that was a progressive UIP over a couple of years. And on the bottom scan, a bit of milky change towards the front of the scan where it says 2A with some lines, some airways within it little bit of reticulation around the back and the 2B scan, those airways are much more dragged out near the, where it says 2B within that milky change. We've got lots more reticulation. That was a progressive fibrotic NSIP. So I'm rattling through this. Oops. So in summary, um, imaging is a very important part of diagnostic process in fibrosis and HRCT, because it's so fine, is excellent in trying to help diagnose the pattern and type of fibrosis, which can help demonstrate treatment response and the severity of the disease. And as you can see, it's a very effective tool in evaluating progressive fibrosis. And we work together as a team to direct the management. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Liz, that, that's brilliant. Um, and do start posting your questions because we all will ask Liz uh, at the end of this session. Um, so several of you are asking about the agenda. Sorry, we haven't talked through it completely. Um, but if you have a look where you registered online for the event, you'll find that's where the agenda is on the Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis website. Um, and we're also posting the agenda in the question and answer box. So you'll find the link there. Okay, I'd now like to introduce Anna, who's going to talk to us about breathing tests. Hello, morning. Morning, thank you, Anna. Hello, hi, thank you. Um, hi, um, yeah, my name is Anna. I'm a respiratory and sleep physiologist at RDNE Hospital. Uh, and I work in the lung function um, department where we do uh, the breathing tests. Um, so, um, you often ask, why do we do breathing tests? Um, I can tell you that um, I'm breathless. I don't need a breathing test. Well, actually, breathing tests, they give us a lot of information. Uh, but generally, they tell us how much air you can take into your lungs um, and how much oxygen is actually going through the lungs to your blood. It gives us uh, quantifiable uh, numbers, uh, which we can keep track of. And uh, that's helpful because we can identify early changes, which then helps the, the ILD team to make a decision on how to move forward. So if your lungs got better, if the, your lungs got worse, um, you know, what can the team, how can the team approach moving forward? Um, so first things first, um, when you come in for your lung function room, you know, you have this big machine, um, quite daunting. Um, rest assured that uh, uh, the equipment is um, quality controlled every single day, uh, it's calibrated, and we actually do the tests ourselves um, every week to check that the numbers are stable. Um, other thing that might play in your mind is uh, in, when it comes um, to infection control, the mouthpiece that you use that is disposable and that is one per person. The other thing to take into consideration is um, contraindications. Are you well enough to come in today to do a breathing test? Um, you know, often patients have chest infections and they still come and they still attempt uh, uh, to do the test. 
um, it is it is helpful to have some numbers. However, obviously, if you are having unusual chest pains or if you had a major uh, surgery on your chest or eye surgery, um, it's, it's best to postpone for another day. And then the other thing when you attend your, your uh, breathing test is why do you have to take your shoes off? I know it's really uh, difficult, even more so if you are feeling um, breathless, taking um, uh, boots uh, during winter. Um, so there is a reason uh, for why we do um, ask you to remove your shoes. Um, and that comes down to predicted values and percentages. Um, So um, when it comes to uh, predicted uh, values, uh, when you ask us, oh, what is the percentage of my lung function? Well, that is highly based on your age. So it takes into consideration the aging of the lung, sex and height. And that's why we ask you to remove your shoes because even a, a you know, two centimeters, you know, one inch uh, can make a difference on the percentage um, the predicted value. Um, how do we get predicted values? Well, that is um, uh, acquired by the Global Lung Index uh, organization. So across the whole world, um, they take um, lung measurements uh, from patients from three to 95 years old, healthy patients. So they know what the lung function should be uh, for for that age, for that sex, for that height. Um, so the first test that you usually uh, do when you, when you come in for your breathing test is uh, spirometry. Um, pretty, uh, you know, in theory, very easy test. Uh, uh, you just have to take a big breath in, blow hard, and um, blow until you empty. Um, but it is, it, I understand it, it is not that easy. Um, the spirometry uh, measures how much of, how much air you can inhale and exhale as fast as you can. Um, we are measuring two main things. So the amount of air that you blow out in the first second and the amount of air that you blow out until you are completely empty. Uh, why is the technique so important? Well, because, um, well, first, for, before that, actually, you often say, why do I need to do so many hard blows? Why can you not just take my biggest one? Well, we are looking for consistent results and we aim to have three consistent blows um, because, you know, technique can be very variable. So if we are taking just one measurement, um, we don't know if that is the real, uh, the best that you can do on that day. The other thing you often say is, oh, I am really empty. I cannot blow any longer, but we ask you to try uh, squeeze as much as you can at the end. And that is because the machine has a flow sensor and the sense how much air is coming out. If there's a long line that it reaches a plateau, then we know that you are empty. But if you suddenly stop and there's an abrupt uh, uh, end, then um, that would indicate to us that there's still air inside your lungs that we need to push and try um, uh, our best to get out. Um, the other uh, most common test that you do when you come in is the DLCO, the, that is the diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. It's also known as the transfer factor. Um, this test is to tell us, um, um, uh, put it simple, how well your lungs uh, absorb the, the gas going uh, through the lung to your blood vessels. Um, so you take a big breath in, we know how much you breathe in, you hold it for about 10 seconds, so it gives enough time for the gas to transfer, and then you breathe all the way out. So we know how much goes in, how much comes out. So on a normal lung, you, when you breathe in, you know, the oxygen goes down to the, the sacs of air, so the 
the alveoli and the oxygen goes from the, the, the lung to your blood vessel. That is on an, in a normal, healthy lung. When it comes to pulmonary fibrosis, uh, the membrane is thick, the scarring of the lung. So when you take a big breath in of oxygen, uh, when the oxygen reaches the alveoli, it's really hard for the oxygen to go through that thick wall to get to your blood vessel. So there's a compromisation of the gas exchange in your lungs. Um, by the way, on that note, spirometry can be done at home with home spirometers, um, but the DLCO, the transfer factor, is something that cannot be done at home. So it has to be done at the hospital. Um, two very common questions we get um, is, you know, if my spirometry is so good, why do I feel so breathless? You know, you might have a good lung capacity, in, which is very common in early stages of uh, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, a normal lung capacity. So you are able to take deep breaths and, and breathe a lot of it out. But the issue is uh, lies on the transfer factor. Um, so you might have a good volume of air, but if your lungs are not taking the oxygen efficiently enough, then um, you feel breathless, even more so when you move. And then the other thing we, uh, uh, we often, uh, other question we often get is, um, why do I need to do the pulse oximeter um, if you are doing the transfer factor? Or um, why is my transfer factor low but my oxygen levels uh, normal. That is two different measurements. Is, is the pulse oximeter is looking at the percentage of um, oxygenated hemoglobin in your uh, blood. It gives us an estimate of the arterial uh, blood, um, of oxygen in your arterial blood. Um, often your oxygen is normal when you are resting. Um, but when you move, when you go up the stairs, if you go for a walk, you might notice that your oxygen drops very quickly. And that's because when you are moving, your lungs, um, um, your muscles need fuel uh, and the fuel is oxygen. But because there's a compromisation of the oxygen going through the lung, when you move and you need more oxygen, then you get shorter breath. So you might notice that uh, when you move, uh, your oxygen goes down, but then when you finally rest, it takes some time for the oxygen to go up again. Um, so yes, breathing tests are really difficult. Um, they are hard work, um, but please bear in mind that they are a really useful tool to monitor the progression of your condition. We can uh, keep a close eye to your lung function, see if there's any uh, reduction of numbers. Sometimes you might feel that your, you know, your symptoms might be stable, but your lung function might show a reduction, um, or you might feel uh, that you are short, more short of breath and the lung function shows uh, that there is a reduction. And sometimes that feels quite validating. Um, and, and lung function is also really uh, useful uh, to monitor uh, treatment. So it's good to have lung function before you start the treatment and then do the lung function to uh, check how your lungs are responding to treatment. One last thing is often patients say, you know, um, if I can't do, or if I don't want to do lung function, is the alternative? Well, you know, uh, like um, Liz uh, just uh, made uh, a presentation on imaging. So yeah, they, they are, x-rays or, or CT scans um, that takes really good pictures and they are really useful uh, to have a good understanding uh, of your lungs uh, condition. But obviously uh, lung function gives a different information that is also useful uh, for the team. Um, yes, that's all, thank you.
Thank you, Anna. That that was Thank that you. was great and really helpful. And and you'll be joining us at the end, I think, won't yeah. you? Thank the you. session. Great. Thank you. Okay. So next, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Anna Duckworth and Dr. Charles Dixon, who are going to talk about how do we use blood tests and genetics to investigate interstitial lung diseases. Lovely. Thank you very much. Sarah, so um, my name's Giles. I'm a respiratory doctor working down in the Southwest with the Exeter team. And Anna is a PhD student at the University of Exeter. And we're going to talk about how blood tests might have a role in the diagnosis. And then secondly, on genetic testing as well. So we've obviously already spoken about diagnosis quite a lot today. Um, and there's not a single test that will be able to uh, confirm a diagnosis. So it's it's usually a combination of factors. So you can see on the screen here that I've got a, a CT scanner and we've heard about that role. And we have a, a pared down version of a spirometer at the top in the screen. That's your breathing test that has a role. We also can't forget about the role of talking to our patients and examining our patients. And there might be a small number of patients who need a bronchoscopy or a biopsy to help in the diagnosis. What we're going to speak about is how blood tests might form part of that puzzle, that jigsaw, to be able to put these things together to be able to make a diagnosis. So there are three main ways that we'll use blood tests when we see people in the pulmonary fibrosis clinic. Firstly, we want to be able to try to identify specific causes of pulmonary fibrosis. So there's about 200 different types of pulmonary fibrosis. And these tests can help narrow it down. Secondly, once we've made a diagnosis, we often want to be able to give some treatments and we need to make sure that different parts of the body are working well before we can start on these treatments. And then also when uh, you're on treatment, we want to make sure that we're not having any significant side effects. And then finally, there's hundreds of different causes of breathlessness other than pulmonary fibrosis. And we want to be able to look for these or see whether they might be there in addition to pulmonary fibrosis to be able to help treat those over time. So when we're thinking about specific causes or associations, well, the first question we sometimes ask is, is there an autoimmune disease? Now, that, what that means is, is the body producing antibodies that could be attacking their own body, and particularly the lungs or the joints, and causing the pulmonary fibrosis? So this is conditions such as connective tissue disease. These are things like lupus, Sjogren's, systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. And we can do blood tests to look for those. Uh, the tests that you might have heard of are called ANA and an anchor. We often do those blood tests. And then it, it, for more specific antibodies that can tell us quite accurately be, it, what's going on, we can do something called an immunoblot, which is a very specialist test that looks for antibodies. Rheumatoid arthritis is related to interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis. And we can do blood tests linked, uh, looking for rheumatoid arthritis. And we especially do these in, in people who have other signs and symptoms that that could be the case. We then have some general blood tests that look for levels of inflammation in the body or look for inflammation in the muscles themselves. We can then look for whether the body is uh, is allergic or having an, a, an, a reaction to something that they're breathing in. This is important for a condition called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And we can check for proteins in the blood that might indicate that the person is having a, a reaction to things such as birds or molds. And then finally, uh, there's a condition called sarcoidosis, which we often see in the pulmonary fibrosis clinic. Um, and we can do two specific blood tests that kind of help make that diagnosis alongside other factors as well. I mentioned blood tests before and during treatment. So often when we've made a diagnosis, we want to give immunosuppressive treatments, a treatment that dulls down the immune system. And before we do this, we need to check that the liver, the kidneys, and often the blood or the bone marrow are working well. If we start treatment, um, it be that immunosuppression or treatment with antifibrotics, which I'm sure many people who are listening today are taking, we want to make sure that the liver, the kidneys and the blood are all working well and not having any side effects from that treatment over time. Finally, we can look for other reasons uh, uh, for breathlessness. So we can look for whether someone might be anemic or an indicator sign of whether they could have heart failure. 
And we can't uh, forget the role of research. So often patients going to the pulmonary fibrosis clinic might be asked to take a, a part in research, give samples of their blood that could be stored over time and try to look for causes of pulmonary fibrosis or better ways of diagnosing it over time. I'm now going to pass over to Anna, who's going to talk uh, about genetic testing. Thanks, Giles. So um, the first thing to say really is genetic risk in ILD or interstitial lung disease is complicated. So I've come up with an analogy that helps me to understand it and think about it, and it's wild swimming. And if you've ever done any wild swimming, you'll know that when the water's deep and there may be things underneath it, but you're fine. But as the water gets more shallow, those things underneath can become hazardous. And the hazardous in, uh, in terms of genetic risk are monogenic variants on the left or single causal genes that might cause the disease and polygenic variants on the right, which are very common. We've all got some of those. And if you've got a lot of those, they might start to cause a problem. But the key, me key message here is if, if the water's deep, you can carry on swimming without any problem. And in terms of those on the left, we had the monogenic variants. Those are the ones we look for in genetic testing. And they're usually described as dominant inheritance with variable penetrance, and that's important. So on the left, we've got dominant inheritance means that a single copy can cause the disease, but the variable, pen variable penetrance means that you might have a single copy, but still not get the disease because penetrance varies, and that's to do with the depth of the water above that variant in the analogy. So why do we test? Well, sometimes pulmonary fibrosis does cluster in families and we call it familial pulmonary fibrosis. And you probably already know, I've seen some of the comments in the chat and we can talk about that. You probably already know if you have this because somebody very close to you has also got an interstitial lung disease. And if we know about that underlying cause, the genetic cause, it can help us to support you and your family better. Um, it's all fairly new, so that's kind of developing. And the important message here as well is that research is really important to help us improve that. So we're looking in the future towards potentially screening, uh, improving early diagnosis for people at risk, looking at new treatments based on those underlying genetic causes, and ultimately looking at prevention. So what can we test for and what will it tell us? Well, this is on the left, a pie chart from a study that was carried out recently in the States, published last year. And they looked at 388 family members who had pulmonary fibrosis in their family. So patients with pulmonary fibrosis who had familial pulmonary fibrosis. And the key message from the pie chart is that they only found causal genes in a quarter of them. So if you go for a panel test through the NHS, the chances are they may well not find anything. They're probably chances of one in four or one in five of finding something. And the other message here is that the top genes listed in that list of, of genes that were found relate to something called telomeres. Telomeres are the bits at the end of the DNA that get shorter as we all get older and seem to be prematurely shortened in some patients. And knowing that helps us to target treatments and um, look at, at carry out research to find causes for that. So can you get tested? And uh, it's all quite new. But in, you can get tested by the NHS. You can request a test if you have a diagnosis. So you can only get tested at the moment if you already have a diagnosis and one of the following things. So if you were diagnosed below the age of 50, so early onset, if one of your first degree relatives, so that's say a parent or a sibling also has an ILD, if you have a suspected short telomere disorder or that your consultant may recognize, such as um, you've got very early gray hair, or you're being considered already for a lung transplant. And so that's through the NHS. And there's also um, an NIHR research study that's looking at short telomeres, um, looking at um, family, familial pulmonary fibrosis, and there's a link there. So as I say, it's complicated. My email address is at the front of this and we can answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. That's great. And um, we will come back in about 10 minutes for a um, more general question and answer session. Um, so th thank you to all those clinicians who have spoken to us about the scans, the breathing tests and the blood tests. Um, so as you all know, we're involving those with lived experience. And we would like to include a couple now who've 
direct experience of pulmonary fibrosis. Andy and Deborah, would you like to come on and introduce yourselves? Good morning. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, we do appreciate it. Um, my name is uh, Andy Priest. Uh, I'm 62 years old. Um, I will apologise straight away. I am reading from notes. I have tried my best not to, but I get it wrong. So I apologise. Um, before I really start, there's something I would really like to say. Um, <clears throat> I would like to thank very much so the NHS um, and the RDE and the Royal Patworth Hospital for everything and everybody has done for me and for other people. Um, without that, I wouldn't be sat here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. My journey started um, uh, with IPF in 2009, uh, 2017 with a cough in the morning, okay through the day, and a cough in the evening. Every day was the same. Eventually getting pneumonia um, and ending up at a um, uh, being looked after by a hospital in Berkshire. I went through many, many tests, um, but unfortunately was never actually told what was wrong with me. Um, we moved from Berkshire in 2019 down to Devon um, to, <laughs> to live the good life as uh, the programme in the 80s. Um, in the October of 2019, sorry, the November of 2019, um, went to the RDE um, to meet Professor Gibbons, um, where we spent a the whole day there. And at the end of the day, um, he told me the grim news of what was wrong with me, uh, which was IPF. Haven't got a clue what that was at the time. Um, and I only had five years to live, uh, which was a big shock, without a doubt. My condition wasn't that bad at the time. Um, I managed to do most stuff that I wanted to do. I went through loads of loads and loads of tests um, to get to that stage. Um, the disease in 2021 um, accelerated incredibly. They put me onto anti. Um, Fibrotics. Fibrotics <laughs> to try and slow the disease down. Um, and so that I could then, uh, um, after a while, the, the disease uh, took over um, and I ended up uh, with a hospital bed downstairs and a commode. Um, and then I was on oxygen um, to the point where I not only had oxygen, in the two little canyons up the nose, but I had to boost myself with a mask as well, just to slide my legs out of the bed to get onto the commode. After many, many tests um, and two bouts of COVID, which obviously knocked me back incredibly, um, I eventually managed to get onto the, uh, the transplant list. Um, in 2022, um, I got incredibly ill, incredibly fast, um, and found it very, very difficult to talk and breathe. I couldn't do both. I certainly couldn't answer the phone either. Um, at that stage, um, the Royal Patworth Hospital uh, were very concerned, and they sent an ambulance and collected me and took me to the hospital. And in their words, we brought you here to look after you, which was very reassuring. Um, I spent a week, the first week in hospital, having many tests. And then I then was put onto a special machine called an ECMO machine um, to give me a little bit longer till a pair of lungs become available. Um, and that was actually a week later. And I had a double lung transplant in the summer of last year. Thank, Thank you, me. Andy. Thank you for sharing that. And, and you talking about the tests, um, you know, how, how did you cope with them? The tests are essential um, and we all have to have them done. 
um, and coping with them, you do cope with them. But I found it very, um, you have to talk. You have to explain to people how you're feeling at the time of the test and take that in consideration. And they do, without a doubt. Um, they are very sympathetic, without a doubt. Um, and if you feel that you cannot do something on the day, just explain why um, and they will understand. Um, for instance, I had to have a CT scan. Laying down flat was incredibly difficult to be able to breathe. Um, and I asked, could I have my head propped up? It wasn't a problem. I explained why it was no problem whatsoever. And we managed to do a CT scan and I managed to, with my head propped up, it made me not quite so nervous as, as I would have been if I was laid down flat. And and you talked a bit about breathing tests and, and the fact that how you feel the day afterwards with breathing tests sometimes. Yes, the, the lung function test is, if you think about it, if any, for the people who do it, you don't do it normally. You don't take that huge, great breath in and blow out. So it is unusual. Um, and the day after, on the day was fine, but the day after I used to suffer with loads of pains in my chest um, and, and slightly out of breath. After a couple of days, that would go away. But every time I did the lung function test on the old lungs, um, it was always very, very painful two or three days later. Yeah. And and did you always do the tests when people no, asked you to? There, there was one occasion where I just wasn't feeling right. I went uh, to have the test and at the last moment I said, look, I just can't do this. Uh, I explained why. Really sympathetic. Don't worry about it, Andy. We'll catch you next time. That's fine. Very, very, very helpful. Yeah, good. And and Deborah, do you like to tell us a bit yeah. about your experience? Uh, hello, I'm uh, Debbie Priest. I have been on this journey right from the beginning. When they say that your husband only has five years to live, it rocks your world. And they say in the marriage vows, in sickness and in health, so never a truer word. I've been by his side supporting him in so many ways and we've had great strength between us working as a team to get through this. It's been an emotional roller coaster and being a full-time carer is extremely hard work. I lost quite a lot of weight through worry and running around after him. Uh, we both had counselling through TalkWorks where they assess the levels of stress that you're under and see how you are in your mindset. Um, but as well as that, uh, after a meeting with Professor Gibbons, he suggested that we have a look at the APF website. And I saw that there were peer group meetings for carers like myself, which were run on a Monday in the first Monday of the month. Uh, we can discuss several things and they brought in external speakers. And Wendy Jones, who organized that work, was very welcoming, welcoming and I found the meetings very informative. But as well as that, the most useful to me was Devon carers who support unpaid carers to maintain their health and well-being. Um, and after a carer's assessment, they signed a peer support volunteer to check on me by phone on a regular basis. Uh, and she actually kept me on her books for a little bit longer because we were going through so much at the time. This was really invaluable. Um, they also paid for six months uh, for a, a lady to come in and clean for me for two hours a week, which is great when you, you're exhausted by looking after somebody uh, to get that help was was great. And, and they treated me with a, a one off payment to treat myself. So as a carer, it's very difficult to go out. So the one thing I really, really missed was going out and having coffees in cafes. So I thought, well, what can I do to treat myself? So I bought myself a coffee machine so I could still have my nice coffees at home instead of going out. And then I, I could be with Andy at the time. Um, it was important to remain positive as a carer. Uh, and and it was uh, we often just sat and held hands together and cried. Um, we uh, when I thought that Andy was going to be, you know, have a, have a difficult night I would drag my duvet down from upstairs and I'll say well should we have a sleepover tonight and I, I slept in the lounge with him just for my peace of mind so that I knew he was okay and and for reassurance for him really 
Um, so I set up my my duvet and set up camp on next to him for the night. That, that's lovely. Thank you for sharing that. And and you two, if if there's some um, one thing you'd like people to take away as a, a message, what what would that be? Never ever give up. It's my main message. Um, it, I mean, I was in a very very dark place, um, and you just got to be determined. I'm very stubborn, <laughs> uh, and I think that helped me. Uh, be very determined. Um, all the nurses and everybody that's looking after you, respect them. They're doing their best for you. And that is very important. Listen to them. Ask questions. They like to be asked questions. Why are you doing such and such? And everything else, all the tests. Why are you doing the test? They like to be asked. And it's best for you to know what's going on. But the main thing is respect the people that is trying to help you which is very difficult when you feel incredibly ill, but you've still got to respect them. And mine, I would say, never lose faith and remain positive. Don't worry about things till there is something to really worry about. Take care of yourself, because if, you, if, the, if you're not okay, then you aren't able to look after your, your loved one. And don't be afraid to ask for help from other people. Chat to people and you won't, you won't be alone in how you are feeling at that particular time thank you you too that that's really really helpful and i think you're getting lots of positive comments here it's obviously very helpful for everyone shall we invite um the rest of this morning session back to join us and then we've got a few questions uh, and while um liz and anna and anna and giles are coming back in um would you mind, Andy, telling people how old you are? That's a question. <laughs> how old you how were old when you had I your am. transplant? Yeah. <laughs> how old I was when I had the transplant? I was 61. Yeah. Yeah. And and people are asking about how common lung transplants are. So at the moment in interstitial lung disease, not that common. Um, we perhaps have one done from our hospital a year, perhaps. So... Age is a factor in transplants, unfortunately, isn't it? And and um, so not many people do get them at the moment. And we might bring that up again later when Professor Gibbons is around for questions. Um, so there are a few questions that have popped up about scans. Um, something to point at you, Liz. Uh, someone asked, is a chest X-ray enough or do you need to have a CT scan? Yeah, so a chest X-ray can be very helpful if it shows that there is fibrosis there, and then we would usually want to, as I said earlier, pin down further what kind of um, underlying interstitial lung disease there is. But they can also be completely normal. Um, so there could be very subtle changes, or perhaps it's just an acute um, cellular NSOP or something like that that we're not seeing, or hypersensitivity that's in acute phase. So usually the clinician would get the symptoms and the physiology and blood tests and everything together to think actually I think there's something going on here and then may then usually in our institution would then go on to request an HRCT so we can have a real good look and sort of identify what's going on because there must be something going on if the patient's having symptoms and things are reflected in their physiology so yeah we would usually do a more detailed scan. Sorry, I'm I muted. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, has there anyone else picked up on any questions that have been going on while I've been chatting to Andy and Deborah? Uh, there was a question. Oh, sorry. I was going to say there was a question about um, having scans for reassurance. And, and, and I think some patients, understandably, as they go along their journey, might want to know what their lungs are doing at any stage in time and I, I totally get that um but I suppose there's also unfortunately with the NHS there's a balance between our expenditure on that and we tend to stick with scanning when things are progressing or perhaps somebody's got an um, acute exacerbation um so I, but I do I totally understand how it must feel to want to see a picture of yourself at any one time to give you some further understanding but at the moment that's not something we tend to offer Sarah is it from what I have noticed unfortunately yes yeah um we tend to think about um whether people are progressing don't we and um you know as, as Anna 
um, De Ponte was saying earlier, we can use other things often to check for progression, um, like breathing tests. So it's not always um, necessary to subject people to scans. Uh, can you comment a bit on radiation na nowadays? Yeah, I mean, so it varies on the type of scan you're doing and the age of the machine and all those kind of things. But I think it's it's roughly about... I hope I'm not wrong, five to eight millisieverts. So if you're talking about background radiation, let's say, so a chest X-ray is three days background radiation, it was a number of years ago, it might be slightly less now. But again, it depends on where you live in the country. So I'm from Derbyshire originally, loads of radon in, in the granite. So my background radiation is a lot more than somebody that lives, I don't know, in London, for example. Um, so an average, I would say, for HRCT is probably one to three years background radiation, so just existing but it depends where you live. So it might be more or less than what you're, what you're exposed to anyway. Um, so it's not a huge dose, obviously, but it's something that potentially, if you're having lots and lots of scans and you start off very young, you might potentially result in the risk of um, a malignancy. But it depends when you start being scanned and how often you have them. So I, on its own, I would not be anxious about having scans, but multiple scans, is, you know, we try to avoid that. That's why we try to ration what we, we do as well. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Giles and Anna, did you look as though you had something bad? Yeah, sorry. So there, there, were, there were just some questions about the specifics of getting genetic testing. And and if you're a worried relative of someone who, who might have a pulmonary fibrosis, uh, whether genetic testing can be available for you. Now, it, it's some slightly complex and actually genetic testing has only been available since the summer of last year for patients with pulmonary fibrosis. But the current situation um, in, in routine practice is that if you have a relative who has pulmonary fibrosis, if they fulfill criteria, they can be referred for genetic testing. And if that genetic testing is, is positive, depending on the result and depending on the specific gene problem that they find, then relatives may or may not be eligible for testing. And often what happens in that situation if relatives are eligible for testing is that patients will be given a letter to give to their relatives and that letter they can take to their GP requesting referral for that, that patient to be referred to the genetic services. So it's a little bit technical at the moment, but but the key thing is that your, your relative has to have had a genetic test already that is positive. And just to add that there have to be two people in the family who've had an ILD, not just one. There's also there's also a question about um, is research being done to determine how much gen genetics is a factor in IPF? And yes, definitely, that's what I'm doing at the moment. So there's definitely lots of research going on. We're very engaged in that. Yeah, that's great. And, and and Anna's doing lots of research, hence your email was on your um, presentation, wasn't it? <laughs> um, you're happy to be contacted. And and just to say that, you know, this is all being recorded and it will all be available on the Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis website in a, in a week or so. And people will be able to watch again and see what questions were available and answers and things. Um, there have been some questions about um, lung transplants and whether they're in one specific hospital. Um, so um, Chris Scotton has helpfully posted on the question and answer that there are five transplant centres in England. Um, that's Newcastle, Manchester, London, Cambridge and Birmingham. Um, so your local consultants would decide where the most appropriate place is for you to be referred. Um, there's people also asking about access to pulmonary rehabilitation. So we're discussing pulmonary rehabilitation um, again this afternoon, and I'll I'll just run through um, a bit about this afternoon before we close for our break this morning. Was there anything else you wanted to add, Anna, on breathing tests, Anna De Ponte? Hi. Um, I guess um, as Adam was was. Um, was saying um during his his talk um we 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 do appreciate how you how you explain to us how you feel on the day um if if you want to try and do lung function on the day that's great but you know we're not going to force you um and we have some time if you need time in between each attempt you know take the time that you need um but I, 
we don't want to come across as forceful, but obviously we want to try get some numbers because we know that that might be helpful for the team. Um, but um, always, you know, always say how you feel. And if um, if you don't want to do the test, it's, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> and people can often really struggle with coughing, can't they? With absolutely, tests. yeah. Uh, patients with ILD, when when we ask to take a deep breath in and hold the breath, uh, that's really um, when the cough kicks in and uh, it can be really frustrating. Uh, you know, we see patients um, really, uh, you know, disappointed that they couldn't do the test, but um, you can only do what you can. Um, but um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And, and no, thank hope, you. I think our physio this afternoon will touch a bit on, on um, that testing. Right. It's time to sort of look at um, breaking for, for a break for everybody. Let me just run through what's happening later. So this afternoon after lunch, um, we've got a living well with pulmonary fibrosis session. Um, we're going to talk about drugs. Um, antifibrotic and immunosuppressant therapy, um, which Professor Gibbons and uh, Dr. Callum Macy will do. And then Bellen, our pharmacist, will be talking about support with your medication. Um, one of our nurses, Jess, is talking about oxygen. Our physio is coming on to talk about activity and breathlessness. Uh, we have a dietitian joining us from Cornwall called Alistair, and then Chris is going to come in and talk about some research um, before we'll have more patient involvement later on after that. Um, we will break shortly for a, a short coffee break, 15 minutes, and we'll ask you all to come back at 11.45. Um, that session will be chaired by Professor Amory Russell and a patient called John Conway. Um, and Professor Athol Wells will be joining us and um, several other doctors from the team at the Royal Brompton Hospital to um, run that session. So we'll see you all at 11.45. Thank you.